Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, the easy button for IEC 62850 security, authentication and encryption for routable goose and sampled values. My name is Beth Capellis and I'm the marketing manager here at Triangle Microworks. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items and some introductions. The webinar is scheduled to be one hour long. We will be stopping for questions a couple of times throughout the webinar, and we'll stay on afterwards to answer as many questions as possible. The audience is on mute, so please submit your questions online using the webinar tool under the section titled Questions. We have several folks answering questions online, specifically Dave Gaukenauer, a senior developer here at Triangle, working mostly on Distributed Test Manager, one of the tools that you'll be seeing here later today. We also have Matt Green, a senior application engineer here at Triangle. Matt has also presented at many of our past webinars, does product trainings and demos, as well as being one of our senior QA testers. In addition to answering questions online, I will read and answer questions during breaks and at the end. Oops. Next, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have three presenters today. First, we have Mark Adamiak, Principal Consultant from Adamiak Consulting. Mark started his career in the utility business with American Electric Power and in mid-career joined General Electric, where his activities have ranged from advanced development, product planning, application engineering, and system integration in the protection and control industry. Mark is an original member of the IEC 62050 Working Group a life fellow of IEEE, a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio, and a GE Edison award winner. Mark was the principal investigator for the EPRI IntelliGrid project to develop a reference architect architecture for the smart grid. Next, we have Herb Fork, Managing Director of Outside the Box Consulting Services. Herb has over 40 years of experience working in the automation, information exchange, standardization activities, and system integration. Previous employment was Westinghouse Pneumologic and Cisco, where he was responsible for the 62050 and SIM integration projects and products. Herb has been involved with 62050 technology since 1982 and cybersecurity since 1993. Herb is an editor of the IC 62050 8-1, editor of several cybersecurity standards, and is the vice president of testing for the UCA International User Group. His work for the UCA has involved the coordination of IEC 62050 interoperability testing in 2011, 2013, 15, and 2017. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Jackson Moore, application engineer at Triangle Microworks. Jackson received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and Computer Engineering from North Carolina State University and has a background in Power System Engineering. Prior to joining Triangle Microworks, Jackson spent five years as a microgrid system engineer, where he designed and developed load management control systems for multi-source microgrids ranging from one megawatt to 30 megawatts. In his current role of application engineer, Jackson serves as a bridge between our customers and our development team, seeking to understand and solve the unique and complex challenges that our clients face. So now that you know everyone, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background on Triangle Microworks before we get started. Triangle was established in 1994, and we are headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have customers in over 70 countries and work mostly with equipment manufacturers, electric utilities, and system integrators. The products that we offer all support the standard SCADA protocols and fall into three categories. First category is source code libraries. We license source code directly to manufacturers for use in their devices and systems. This allows for a much faster time to market and greatly reduces their cost and development time. We also provide testing tools supporting these libraries and protocols. These tools are used for communication testing in both the lab or the field. They are designed to troubleshoot, simulate, and automate testing. 
Lastly, we also provide a SCADA data gateway supported on both Linux and Windows for protocol translation and data concentration with standard SCADA protocols, as well as OPC. We are heavily involved in the standard committees that support SCADA protocols, like UCA Group for 62050 and DMP User and Technical Committees. Through our participation, we help define the protocols, we stay up to date on the changes taking place, and ultimately provide feedback based on our customers' needs as the protocols continue to evolve. So now that you know a little bit more about Triangle, I'd like to hand it over to Mark to kick off the webinar. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everybody online here today. <clears throat> We're gonna start off by looking at use cases. Uh, you, you may have heard of these terms of routable goose and routable sample values. We're going to look at what are called oops, use cases for the development of these protocols or these profiles as they are referred to in IEC 61850. So these use cases, most of which are actually in service and one or two uh, could become in service. First one is the concept of using of, of transfer tripping. In a, in many utilities today, <clears throat> there this architecture of having a say a 69 kV bus in this case here, the breaker stepping down to multiple 69 kV to 13.8 kV transformers. In this architecture, for a fault between the circuit breaker and maybe an internal fault inside the transformer, protection at 69 kV cannot see that fault. What is done today is the application of what is known as a ground switch. When local protection does detect a fault in this region, it operates a ground switch. The ground switch literally places a line to ground fault on the 69 kV system. That line to ground fault can now be seen by the 69 kV protection and subsequently goes and trips the 69 kV breakers as well and, and the other breakers on the, on the feeder also trip subsequently. <clears throat> it is not a good idea to put a, a ground fault on a 69 kV system. What is happening, first of all, as the system grows in strength, the ground fault becomes greater and greater. Secondly, the ground switch itself is reaching the limits of the technology. So an alternate solution has been sought. Alternate solution here, is to add device, uh, digital devices that can connect with the protection at each remote substation. And when, a, when the relay that is covering that range of fault between the breaker and the transformer detects a fault, it sends a message to the local communication relay. That local communication relay then set, can then send a message a, a, from one device to all the other devices. In fact, I'll, I just want to clarify a term here. This is what's known as multicast. In multicast, one device sends a message and is received by multiple other devices. Obviously, the other the, the uh, multicast message trips all breakers on that system. A cost-benefit analysis can be created to look at the benefits of a ground switch versus a transfer trip system. The cost of the cost and installate the and well the, the purchase and installation cost of a ground switch is about $50,000 per switch. In as much as you may have as many as seven of these switches or ground switches per line, that's a total cost of $350,000. The protection system cost is the same for both solutions. 
Now, if we look at a multicast solution, we're looking at, se at seven devices at about $25,000 per device installed. We're looking at $175,000. So clearly, and the assumption here, by the way, is that the communications exist, which may or may not be the case. But in this, in this particular customer, it was exi in existence. So as a result, we have the difference between $350,000 and $135,000 savings in, this, in, in, in migrating to the communication-based solution versus the ground switch based solution. A, I'm gonna say a growing implementation these days on the utility infrastructure is what is known as remedial action schemes or typically abbreviated as RAS. RAS can best be thought of, now, this is beyond traditional protection. This is this is power system protection. This can best be visualized in terms of today's cars where you have an automatic braking system. If your car detects you're going to hit the car in front of you, it automatically applies the brakes. This is exactly what happens with a remedial action system. When the remedial act, the remedial action system has three components. It has monitoring devices that measure the state of the power system through either status and or power flow measurements. There is logic processing. The logic processing collects information from all these substations and puts it into a logic engine that analyzes the results today based on pre-existing or pre-identified uh, braking conditions, we'll call it. And then finally, if it's determined that the brakes need to be put on the power system, the, the operation or the control messages are sent out to mitigation devices that actually execute commands to put the brakes on, typically to uh, either remove generation or to remove load. So this is the architecture for remedial action. What is needed here is the ability for multicast, meaning that again, the monitoring devices can send the message to multiple logic processors and the logic processors can send the message, one, one message to multiple mitigation devices. So if you look at the cost benefit of putting in a, a uh, centralized, so there are many distributed RAS systems today and they'll be put in for one particular scheme. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, requires that all RAS schemes be tested once a year. So of the, this particular cost benefit analysis only focuses on the testing aspect of the RAS. This does not go into the architecture savings uh, of, of the, of the uh, centralized RAS architecture. So uh, for testing of a central logic system, two engineers at $2,000 a day can test all the RAS schemes from one central location. If we assume that there are say 20 RAS schemes in the utility, then you're looking at these tw the, at each scheme an engineer having to travel to the site, two engineers traveling to the site at 2,000 a day for 20 schemes, you're looking at $80,000. So the, if nothing else, at least $76,000 per year savings in, in the centralized remedial action scheme. As we've all heard, there is significant, there are significant issues with broken wires falling on the ground and causing ignition of, of flammable materials on the ground in remote locations. This is typically happening out in the West Coast, California in particular, but Washington and Oregon would have similar type of situations. An application, so the goal here is there is a challenge to try and eliminate broken wires from falling on the, energized broken wires from falling on the ground and igniting material on the ground. There's an interesting solution that has arisen 
using something called a phaser measurement unit or a PMU. The PMU measures the instantaneous angles at both ends of the power line or at multiple ends, as many PMUs as there are, these measurements can be made. When a power line breaks, as shown here, the phase angles at the two different ends of the power line change dramatically and almost instantaneously. So by sharing the information, having PMUs at each end of the line send information, not only to the other end, but to the other ends that may be, that you may have a, a Y connection at a point where one, where a line splits and goes in two or three different directions. This again identifies the need for what is called, uh, we'll call it routable sample values. That means it's a multicast of synchro phaser values from one location to multiple other locations. The calculation today, this is in place actually, at, 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 uh, online at a, um, on several lines in the utility. And today, all of the data goes back to one centralized location for analysis. However, this architecture with routable sample values can now send a message from PMU to other local PMUs where such a calculation can be made. Cost savings from this, you ask anybody in California, it's immeasurable. People would love to have many of their houses back that have burned down. An evolving technology on the utility front is frequency-based variance. The power system being made up of mostly electromechanical components, although that is changing, responds as an electromechanical system. Specifically, in the, if you're looking at the picture on the screen here, when you drop a stone into water, it sends out ripples from the center point of where the stone was dropped. This exact same thing happens in the power system. When you drop a power plant on a system, on, a, on the grid, that power plant sends out frequency ripples throughout the entire uh, interconnected grid. This is shown in these pictures here that are part of what is called the frequency network or FNet. And the pictures run from left to right. On the left picture, you see some coloration there that shows low, the, the dark red here is nominal 60 Hertz frequency. The lighter blue and the yellow represent dips in frequency at this given location. As we go to the next one, we see deeper blues as the frequency continues to go, go down, and we see the other frequencies start to ripple, all, ripple out across the power grid. Many, if not all, independent system operators would be interested in seeing this kind of a plot. What this plot shows is exactly where the power plant went down. That, that's the point where the pebble got dropped into the water. So such data distribution, again, requires multicast communications, where the frequency measurements of all these points are sent to multiple other operating centers all around a particular grid area. The cost benefit of that, by the way, <clears throat> again, is immeasurable because knowing where a power system, a power plant went down, can allow the operators to more quickly react to that scenario. Lastly, we're going to look at the concept of surgical load shed and demand side management. <clears throat> Many years ago, there was a test at American Electric Power in which I was involved, and a demand side management was, a system was put in place. Demand side management says that the goal is to manage the load on the grid through price signals. In this particular application, pricing varied from low, medium to high, and to critical peak pricing. 
whereas the low price might have been three or four cents a kilowatt hour, the critical peak pricing was 30 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. In the homes in these locations, there were load responsive devices. So for example, the hot water heater upon critical peak pricing could be turned off. You don't need hot water at 30 cents a kilowatt hour or 40. Uh, with inflationary times today, it could be 50 or 60. Uh, the HVAC system, uh, instead of turning it off, what it would do is to change the set point. So if you were cooling your house at 71 degrees, you could automatically change that set point to say 73 or 74 degrees <clears throat> without having any major discomfort in your house. An electric dryer has a heat cycle, which is a 5 kW load. That can be turned off uh, based upon uh, demand side pricing. Same for a dishwasher. A dishwasher has a, has a uh, heater in it. A heater can be turned off for a period of time and not affect anybody's lifestyle. This requires getting a message from one central controller to hundreds of, hundreds of thousands or even millions of homes. Multicast can provide this solution. In fact, testing has shown that like with, with 900 megahertz radio, one radio can reach a, a radius of some 30 miles with this communication technology. There is a side part of this, which is the, the surgical load shed. On the previous slides, we talked about demands, when we talked about uh, remedial action, one of the remedial actions is to completely turn off a feeder. When that feeder is turned off, uh, well, you lose everybody there. So in this case here, uh, a multicast message can be used to uh, distribute the controls and the pricing. The cost benefit in this application is very interesting because in the cost benefit, the if you had to meet the load, which right now is not being met, for example, in California, the ISO there has already announced that on hot days, there's not enough generation to, to supply all the anticipated load. Building new loads is going to cost about $500 per kW. This would be for a gas turbine, or about $2,500. Demand side management allows for the implementation of megawatts. This, that is, to take watts away from the load, such a system is estimated at about $1,500, which is a cost difference of about $1,000 per home. For a million homes, you're looking at $1 billion cost savings and no carbon emissions. So just real quick, the solutions for this are based on a IEC 6100. There are now four profiles for this multicast messaging. The original one known as the GOOSE, the Generic Object Oriented Substation Event, which is a multicast model. This has been enhanced in the most recent release of IEC 61850, which adds in the concept of routable goose and routable sample values. These routable protocols use a routable IP multicast address, which allows the one message to be sent via networking in many, many different locations. Okay, that's what I have on this section here. Beth, I turn it back over to you. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Herb. So, Herb, I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. And you should have the screen. What are you guys seeing? Full we're screen? All, yep, we're all set. We can see your, your presentation. Okay. So, Mark was talking about uh, goose and routable goose, and routable goose comes with security, and it was designed for resiliency. So I'm going to go a little bit into the technologies behind the security and the routable goose itself. So when we talk about security priorities, there is a large difference between IT priorities 
in OT priorities, and you can basically classify them as CIA for IT, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability, or AIC, which is availability, integrity, and confidentiality uh, for the OT world. If you think about the threats in the utility industry, we really need to have tamper detection, a way to authenticate controls, protect from spoof and replay, and, at, and for confidentiality, it's uh, information leakage. Um, the counters to most of these threats are what are called message authentication codes or hashed message authentication codes and the use of public key infrastructure and common keys. Now, Mark introduced the concept of multicast, and it turns out that uh, multicast presents an issue where you have to share a common key amongst the participants and those have become symmetric keys and we'll go into that a little bit as we progress here one of the things that is coming and i am not a NERC auditor is this statement in the uh, NERC sip version 7 part 5 that all external routable connectivity for routable connectivity must have an electronic access point. Um, and what's significant here is the word of connectivity and not protocol. And this has a significant impact on uh, a lot of the applications that are using layer two tunneling through L2TP over VPNs. I am not a NERC auditor, but that statement leads me to believe that if you tunnel layer two over a VPN using IP, that is routable connectivity. And therefore, you have to have an EAP uh for that connection additionally there used to be an exclusion for layer two goose and i cannot find that exclusion uh, any longer in sip 7. there is also a lot of work going on in what's called defense in depth based upon iec 62443 and this would basically require mutual authentication of the ends. And it really means a land-to-land -land VPN is not enough to accomplish this task. There's also a lot of discussion in the industry about what's called zero trust. And zero trust, I've highlighted the major concepts here. And it really requires end-to-end -end authorization, regardless of if you're on the same network or not. Um, so this is from NIST 800-207. And NERC is actively discussing this concept for potentially future versions of NERC SIP. And again, this kind of emphasizes that land land VPNs are not enough. If you go to zero trust, you need mutual authentications end to end between the peers. Uh, it's unknown the implications from a NERC SIP perspective on internal substation communications. But if you look at this highlighted here, um, it would seem to apply there as well. So routable goose, routable sample values, and secure layer two goose and layer two sample values are really structured and setting up to support uh, the concept of zero trust. 
So the um, uh, way goose and sample values and routable goose and routable sample values works is basically you have a control block and a set of subscribers in an SC in a system configuration description file, which is how things get configured in 61850. Also in those files are all the communication addressing. One of the things this does not typically address is bringing in test sets into the substation. And we all want to bring in test sets or monitoring uh, equipment. And you really don't want to be able to, you really don't want to have to decommission security to bring in this equipment. So the security plane, which is the management of the policies and the keys uh, in 62351 9 is set up to allow a transient cyber asset to come in and be authenticated without having to change your security configurations. So the transient uh, test set can come in. It's got credentials that can be authenticated by the what's called the key distribution center here. And then it can participate as normal for testing. So a group's really defined as a triplet of information, which is the service type. Are you using layer two goose or sample values or routable goose or routable sample values? The destination address, which could be a layer two MAC address or a multicast IP address and the data set reference, which represents the information to be that's being published. The theory is, is if any of this triplet varies, there can be different keys and different policies associated. So it's very strong if you take that approach, because even if you break a key for one group, you have not disrupted the security for the other groups. 62351-9, the use of our goose and uh, goose and sample value security has two mechanisms. One's called a pool and one's called a push exchange. Everybody has to support pool and push allows the KDC to push new keys and policies out to the group members, which are the publishers and the subscribers. From a resiliency and a resynchronization perspective, when a group member powers up, it has to do a pull to uh, reestablish synchronization in case it missed a push. If it receives a push from the KDC that is of an item that it's interested in, but it can't decrypt or de-sign the packet properly, um, it has to do a pull to resync. And we're going to go a little bit under the covers of how this works next. So in a group pull, there are two phases. One is phase one and one is phase two. So we're looking at uh, a simplified view of the information that's exchanged. A group member, when it sends the initial message on a pull, specifies a Diffie-Hellman group, uh, an array of proposed information, which consists of a Diffie-Hellman group, the key type it wants, the size of the key, the lifetime of what's called the security association, and some other parameters. When the uh, KDC responds, it responds with one selection. The group member then generates a nonce, 
and provides it to the KDC. And a nonce is a cyber uh, random number, basically. The KDC sends uh, its knots back, and all of this information is used to derive uh, ephemeral keys that can be used for encrypting the next set of messages, which uh, provides the identity certificate of the group member and which contains the public key of the group member. There's other information in this packet, but related to this, there is a signature, which is signed with the private key associated with this certificate. So if the um, contents are tampered, the signature won't match. If the identity certificate being provided does not match with the private key, the signature won't match. And then the KDC provides its certificate and signature uh, back to the group member. This provides mutual authentication between the KDC and the group members. And as part of PKI infrastructure, the KDC or the group member can validate that this, these certificates are signed by the appropriate certificate authority and through either online certificate status protocol or certificate revocation list can verify that the certificate is still valid. Uh, the RID indicates that these are exchanges are basically encrypted. So in phase two, as long as the security association exists, a group member can request uh, keys and policies for a given uh, set of, for a given group, it gets, an accept or a deny with certain policy parameters. The group member acts it, and then the KDC delivers keys and policies. Um, there, it delivers two traffic encryption keys that overlap, and a key encryption key that's used for the push if it is to be used in the future. The reason for overlapping is for resiliency purposes, and the, these keys expire typically every 24 hours. So by de delivering two keys simultaneously, you're delivering 48 hours worth of operational keys that can be used within the substation. And again, this is to create the availability and the resiliency of the system. So what are the policies that are delivered? It's the rotation time of the keys, the activation delay, which is what creates the overlap between the current key and the next key, the confidentiality algorithm to be used, and please note none is allowed. So by using none, the, pa the payload is not encrypted, but it is still signed, as you will see, in the operational plane. And this can allow edge inspection as is required by NERC SIP. The message authentication algorithm, uh, which is what's used to sign the published packets for goose and sample values. And here are the options that are currently codified within 62351-9. There's also, as Mark mentioned, a key delivery assurance policy. And if that is turned on, the group members have to acknowledge that they have received the keys and for a particular group. Once a given level of assurance is reached, 
the KDC can inform the publisher that enough group members have received the keys and have acknowledged them, and therefore it's okay to rotate the keys when the keys uh, need to be rotated. There is a subtlety here. Most people would go to 100% uh, of a group needing to receive keys, but it is really a design choice between resiliency versus the need to continue security key rotation. This only works in reality when keys are being pushed. Um, in the real time plane, what you're looking at here is the security information was added to the end of the goose packet without impacting the actual encoding of the payload of goose or sample values. The benefit in doing this is you can have a mixed mode substation where some uh, messages are published with security and others are published without security and a subscriber can be non-secure but receive a secure wrappered message here unless it's encrypted of course and still process the goose payload as normal and that's just the quirk of ethernet because this stuff down here looks like ethernet padding. The routable has uses UDP IP and then wraps security around the normal goose or sample value payloads. Encryption is optional here, but authentication is mandatory. So uh, because of all of this and the ability to Non, not encrypt, uh, the utilization of Argus in 62351-9 allows ed edge inspection. And as I mentioned before, it can be used in a zero trust environment to help establish uh, ed, uh, mutual authentication. So one of the big problems with security or concerns for users is how hard is it to configure security and maintain it? And basically, I've been consulting with a company called PCI Tech for a product called Garibaldi, which is a key distribution center. And you can literally configure and commission security in less than five minutes. So, what we're going to demonstrate here is logging into Garibaldi, configuring the database and the database credentials, importing the security authority certificate so that uh, group members in the KDC can be authenticated with each other, importing the identity certificate for the KDC, setting the global policies, and importing the SCL file. And that's all that's required to actually get started with security. Now, I'm not going to do this live, but in order to achieve this in five minutes, it requires that you actually plan this all out. So this is a video that I'm going to run that goes through the steps. So the first step is we're going to start a timer. And we have to wait for this. But, and we're going to log in. And we're going to log in with a two factor based digital attribute certificate. We're going to select SQLite as the database. And when we save, the schema and the database is actually being created here. And you can see that was successful. We're going to go and just configure a name for the KDC at this point in time. It's just for display purposes. Then we're going to go and add 
the certificate authority certificate that's used for the identity certificate. And this is a public certificate that's been added. And now we're going to go and install the uh, identity certificate for the local KDC. And this is a certificate that includes the public and private key, and the private key is protected by a passphrase. So that has now been added. Now we're going to go and evaluate, do we want to do key confidentiality? What hash algorithm do we want to use for the message authentication code? And we're just going to keep it with CBC. We're going to enable uh, push. We're going to keep the interval for key rotation at 12 hours, and we're going to turn on KDA. And now we're going to go import the SCD file, selecting which publication control blocks we want to manage. And this is a small SCD file. So if it's a larger file, it's going to take longer to import, obviously. And there you go. Um, this shows you all of the uh, publication control blocks, if they're marked local, they're actually being managed by this KDC. None uh, means it's not being managed at all. Okay. Uh, and you can see we finished this in really two and a half minutes. And two minutes later from here, uh, from this point, the uh, KD Garibaldi will actually start serving keys. So with that said, oops, I didn't want to do that. Excuse me for the FUBA. If you have two relays and prior to key distribution, if you look into them, you can see that all of the keys are expired. After the KDC starts up, you can see that all of them have the two keys. And if you look, here's the overlap. So at this, when this becomes active, this guy, ha this key has not expired. So the group member, if it receives a key ID for either one of these, it can use those keys. Um, we can also uh, show if the keys have been delivered. So you can see uh, in a lab that the keys were delivered here and that the publisher received the keys. And there are additional functions in Garibaldi that we won't cover at this point in time, but you can use radius or username password login. There's logging an extensive logging infrastructure which includes structured list uh, syslog and the ability to change policies per data stream and with that i am going to turn it back over to beth to go to jackson thanks herb um we are running a little bit short on time so i'm not going to spend too much time on questions right now although we do have some stuff coming in um, one question I would like you to uh, answer her before I switch to Jackson is we had someone ask, can you clarify what KDC is? Key Distribution Center. It's the uh, application or appliance that actually the group members talk to to receive their keys and policies. Okay. Thanks, Herb. Um, with that, uh, Jackson, I went ahead and made you presenter. You want to share your screen? And we can see your screen. Jackson, you're on mute. My apologies. Thanks, Beth, and thanks, Herb.
Um, now that we've discussed how emerging use cases uh, for 61850 extend beyond the substation, as well as the growing need for security and how we can implement it in these wide area applications, I'm going to walk through a demonstration where we can see routable, encrypted, and authenticated 61850 communications in action, as well as demonstrate some of the reasons why they uh, provide benefit. For this demonstration, I'll be using an upcoming release of our SCADA communication testing and simulation tool, Distributed, Man Distributed Test Manager, or DTM, seen here um, and how it fits into the 61850 process. At its core, DTM is used to simulate clients and servers from a variety of industrial communication protocols. Today, we'll be using 61850. However, what sets DTM apart is the variety of powerful ways a user can interact with and control the device that's being simulated. If you have attended previous webinars or used the tool yourself, you may be familiar with these features, such as our automated data signage GUI, support for several scripting languages, and most recently, our test actions interface. Um, today, I'll be using DTM to simulate uh, a system configuration description file, or SED. An SED describes a complete 61850 substation in detail using the substation configuration language, or SEL. It contains a description of the physical substation layout, communication definitions, as well as IED and data templates found within the substation. Several of the IEDs described within the SED I will be simulating today have been configured to communicate via encrypted and authenticated routable goose messages. I want to point out that this simulation is powered by the underlying Triangle Microworks 61850 source code library, which includes support for routable GOOS sampled values, as well as encryption and authentication. This means our 61850 monitor and troubleshooting tool, shown on the last slide, Test Suite Pro, will also soon include support for routable and secure communication. Let's take a look at what the imported SED looks like in DTM. When the SED was uh, imported into DTM, several things occurred. First, this single line diagram was generated from the substation section of the SED. Devices such as breakers and switches, as well as protection and control functionalities present in the single line are automatically linked to data attributes from the data model of various IEDs contained within the SED. For a detailed look at how this process works, I suggest revisiting some of our past webinars, for example, 61850 Tools and Techniques. Next, I will browse over to the IEDs folder where we see each IED found in the SED has been created. In this case, these IEDs are 61850 servers. From a 61850 communications perspective, these IEDs are indistinguishable from the physical devices they are simulating. As previously mentioned, several of these servers have been configured for secure and routable GOOS communication. Let's take a look at the settings uh, unique to those features. First, because we're using routable 61850 today, I wanna highlight that we have a routable IP address selected. This is the outgoing IP address, um, which routable GOOS and sampled value messages will include as a source address. If an IED has multiple network interfaces and IP addresses, this allows the user to specify which IP address will be used for the routable communications. Next, I'm gonna come over to the advanced tab and I wanna highlight settings that are specific to security. We have indicated the IP address of our key distribution server or KDC, uh, which Herb talked about during his talk. We're using Garibaldi as our KDC server. When our IED performs a pull sequence to retrieve keys um, from the KDC, this is the address our IED will use to reach out. We'll take a closer look at that sequence in a moment. Below that, we see our passwords field. This allows the IED to access or open the signed identity certificate and extract the private key. Certificates are seen below. These include the certificate authority, which is shared with the KDC, and the signed identity certificate unique to this IED. Note that these certificates are not contained within the SED and must be configured in each IED, which utilizes authentication and encryption. To understand how these certificates are used, let's take a look at a network capture showing the resynchronization process, which occurs between the IEDs and the KDC server 
when the IED first boots up. The group of messages we see here are known as a group pull sequence. This occurs when our IED first comes online and reaches out to the KDC. The first two messages establish the parameters for secure association, or SA, and this information is used to derive the ephemeral symmetric key that's specific to the secure association. The derived ephemeral key is used to encrypt messages three through five, or I should say message exchanges three through five. The third message exchange um, coming from the IED contains an encrypted payload that allows uh, for the protected exchange of the X509 public identity certificate. The KDC validates the certificate and checks if the IED is indeed allowed to request keys. If yes, the KDC responds to this third message with an encrypted payload so that the IED can mutually authenticate the KDC. The fourth message um, is used by the IED to request a key for a specific data stream, in our case, a goose stream. The KDC responds with policy information and the IED verifies its reception with a fourth message. And finally, in the fifth message coming from the KDC, keys are delivered, um, which the IED will use to encrypt the data stream. So now that we've seen the vertical resynchronization process, which takes place between an IED and the KDC, let's look at the horizontal communications which occur between two IEDs. Moving back to DTM, I'm going to trigger a secure goose message to be sent between the two devices. In the right pane, uh, we see the subscriber, and on the left, the publisher. This is just a view of the data model. Um, as I set this to true here, you'll see the message over here comes to true. When I go back to false, the subscriber sees the message uh, come to false. And this is all happening um, via 61850 secure commu goose communications. Now, this is another ID which looks very similar, but has uh, not been configured for security. And on this one, I'm gonna do the same thing, set it to true, and we'll see that on the subscribing ID, it's set to true, and then I'm gonna to toggle it back to false. And now we're gonna switch back over to uh, Wireshark and take a look at what this capture, or what this exchange would look like in a capture that I previously taken. We'll start out by looking at the uh, unsecure message, or traditional layer two, which does not utilize security. A packet, um, expanding a packet within this capture will look familiar to those of you who have analyzed 61850 network captures in the past. The entire packet is visible, but what I really want to highlight is the data portion here at the bottom. What we see is plain text, uh, the payload of the message. In this case, we can see the RREC st.close uh, was set to false in this message. If we sorted through this, we could find the exact, exact message uh, that I just triggered. Um, now I want to switch over to the same type of message, but coming from uh, a device which is configured to use security. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is the header section. Uh, within this section, we see several fields which we did not see on the unencrypted stream. And let's walk it through, through a few of those. Timestamp of the current key start of usage. This indicates uh, when the key became valid. Below that, we see uh, countdown, countdown time until key rotation. As Herb mentioned earlier, this is a setting which is configurable uh, in the KDC. And finally, we see current key ID. There's two different keys that were delivered uh, as part of the resynchronization phase, and this indicates to the subscriber which of the two keys should be used by the publisher during encryption, and in turn, which key should be used by the subscriber during decryption. But this brings me to the payload itself, which is really the most interesting. What I want to highlight here is that it just says unknown. Uh, this is because it is encrypted and the data is unintelligible. This means that a bad actor sniffing the network would be unable to discern the contents of the captured message. To further illustrate how powerful this point is, let's discuss a few ways that security events can impact the system. Specifically, I want to talk about a type of network attack known as spoofing. A spoof attack is a form of network attack in which a fraudulent packet or group of packets 
is injected into a network. Due to their fraudulent na nature, payload and header information of the spoofed packet are chosen by the attacker, making detection of a sufficiently sophisticated attack difficult, if not impossible, to detect without authentication. To demonstrate this, I'll be injecting two spoofed messages into our network using a tool called PlayCap. Specifically, these goose messages are going to uh, change the same two values which we played with earlier. The opx.general on RBRF1 of IED line one LPU and uh, the line two LPU. Again, line one has been configured for security and in, in this case, authentication, whereas the line two I, uh, LPU has not. So when I hit play, we're gonna watch as the subscribing device receives these messages. This top one is the secure, and this bottom one is the one which has not been configured for security. So we see the bottom one toggling from true to false. This is due to the fact that the subscriber is receiving both legitimate and spoofed messages, with the legitimate messages sending a false, uh, where the spoofed messages are sending a true. And this kind of illustrates 61850's known vulnerability to spoof attacks. And I'll go ahead and do it again. In contrast, we see the message uh, configured for security did not change. Uh, this is because uh, the payload of the message was altered and therefore the message could not be authenticated by the subscriber and therefore was, was discarded. I hope this serves to demonstrate the power of security and uh, what it means for 61850 and its applications, especially as they extend beyond the local substation. Now let's shift gears and I wanna bring up Garibaldi, which Herb showed us in the video earlier. Garibaldi is the key distribution center server. And I wanna demonstrate where you can see the settings and alter the settings that are specific to this publisher subscriber group that we just looked at. When the SED file was imported into Garibaldi, as Herb shown, uh, it shared configuration information about each IED, shown here, publication groups, shown here, and subscribing IEDs present in the substation. For example, which IEDs are subscribed to which streams and which streams should be encrypted and authenticated uh, or routable or not. Also seen here is configuration which is not contained which, within the SED file such as which encryption algorithm will be used, the intervals at which keys will be rotated, and other settings. These may be set as a global policy applying to the entire SED or set individually. And again, I wanna highlight that all of these settings can be set individually and altered, even uh, the publication groups without the need to re-import an SED file. This is particularly useful for testing and troubleshooting your secure environment. And it also serves to illustrate my final point which th is that streams can exist within the same network or even IED and have different security settings or even no security settings at all. Additionally, routable and non-routable uh, goose and sampled values can coexist on the same network or even the same device. Oops. Um, this means that your migration to a secure environment does not need to be wholesale. If encryption is deemed necessary for only a portion of the IEDs in your network communications, or even a portion of the communications coming from a single IED, that's perfectly fine. You can mix and match layer two, routable, authenticated, and authenticated and encrypted. And with that, um, I hope you have enjoyed getting to see substation security in action. And I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Beth for any questions. Thanks, Jackson. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we get to questions, I know we've run over time just a little bit here, so I appreciate everyone staying on. And like I mentioned earlier, we're happy to stay on as long as questions are coming in. Um, before I shift to that, I just want to uh, mention a couple of closing thoughts. Um, the webinar will be posted to our webpage um, in a couple of days. Um, so just feel free to visit trianglemicroworks.com and you should see it on the, the homepage as you, if you scroll down. 
You also will receive a survey after you leave this webinar today. If you answer the questions on that survey, you will automatically get a email that will have a link to the recording as well. Um, and we certainly do appreciate your feedback on the webinar and, and uh, the information that you saw here today. Um, you can download an evaluation license to DTM. This is a tool that you just saw. If you'd like an evaluation license to Garibaldi, uh, you can email us directly at sales at trianglemicroworks.com. And certainly if you have any other questions that we can help with, please feel free to just shoot us an email. We'd always appreciate hearing from you. Um, so with that, we do have uh, some questions still coming in that I'd like to, to just share with the entire audience. We do have quite a large number of folks still on, so I appreciate you guys sticking with us. Um, so I'm gonna open this up to the panel. I'll just start to read from what's come in most recently. Uh, regarding the encryption, what about network bandwidth? Wouldn't this be an issue for old substations? Old comm devices need to be changed. Did the cost savings shown earlier consider this upgrade? I'll open that up to Mark or to, to Herb. Um, I'll, I'll take it, Beth. Um, so uh, it, it really depends what your infrastructure is. Um, depending upon what you select uh, the algorithm for for encryption and signing, um, it can be as minimal as approximately 32 bytes in addition to the uh, Argus header. Um, in another of the questions, uh, somebody asked uh, what type of bandwidth is required to use Argus outside of a substation. And at um, a major North American utility, uh, they're doing uh, 40 Argus messages coming out of the substation and uh, with a T1 both over uh, LAN WAN technology and over microwave. So it's not that much of a requirement, but you can calculate it all based upon your performance requirements and the number of devices and that type of stuff. Okay, thanks, Herb. Um, I've got another question that I think will probably be for you, Herb. I see that you answered online. Even with the encryption process, um, can the transmission time requirements for Goose messaging still be accomplished? And I think the answer to that is yes. There is a um, uh, misunderstanding of what the three milliseconds really represents. But uh, with modern hardware, with crypto acceleration, I've not seen anything beyond a one millisecond addition. But it does depend on your protection uh, requirements. Okay, thanks, Herb. Next question. Can you please show the sections in the SCD file where this, these security configurations are set? Also, does the SCD contain information about KDC? Okay, so there's a communication section in the SCD, uh, which is where, you know, destination uh, goose and our goose are defined, as well as the addresses of the IEDs themselves. And uh, for Garibaldi, it is supplied with an ICD that indicates that it is a, um, KDC, and let's see if I can find that. Uh, uh, and maybe I can show that. I don't I, know. I can change uh, the next presenter. Uh, hang, hang on, I'm searching. Okay. While Herb is searching, I can confirm that the security aspects only add one millis add the one millisecond on an end-to-end -end basis. 
which means that maybe about 500 microseconds on the encoding side and 500 microseconds on the decoding side. And that's been, uh, that's been tested. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Herb, any luck? Yep, I've got luck. <laughs> so um, if you'll make me presenter. Yep, there you go. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. This is the ICD that typically comes with Garibaldi. Um, I don't know how familiar the person who asked that question is with SCL, but an ICD the You might be cutting out Herb. A template is reserved to indicate that it's coming from an ICD. And you can see that here at this access point here, there's this attribute that says uh, KDC equals true. So that indicates that for this IED, at what, which gets renamed and readdressed in the communication section as part of its integration into the SCD, um, is where you can reach a KDC. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, yes, thanks, Herb. I think very thoroughly. Another question, I think, for you. Uh, questions about certificates. How are they generated? Um, well, the ones that get distributed with Garibaldi use an open source tool called XCA. It's freely downloadable. It's um, a lot easier to use than OpenSSL for certificate management. In a real utility infrastructure, you would use something like that or a PKI certificate infrastructure probably with an intermediate or a reg regional security uh, certificate authority set up. It really depends on the um, uh, utility uh, deployment scheme. Thanks, Herb. Next question. What is the impact on delivery time on a goose message when additional security features are being used? I think we mentioned that it's one milli, no more than one millisecond. Okay. Now the next question, which phase one or two are more critical to assure Argus flow in the network? It has to be both of them. Okay. I think we might be coming to the end. I have one last question here. What equipment is needed to implement Argus between two substations approximately 20 kilometers apart? Um, probably routers. And if it's a BES system, a medium impact BES system, uh, probably a firewall with, you know, ACL capability. I, I would okay. augment, you done, Herb? Um, yeah. I was just going to augment that to say make sure it supports IGMP version 3 and also supports protocol independent multicast in the routers. Yep. Thanks, Mark. So, Beth, there, there's, uh, there are two other open questions here. Do you want mm -hmm. me to just read them? Yep, go for it. How many IED vendors are supporting our goose and our sample values currently? Um, so GE and Toshiba are IED vendors that currently support it. There are at least three other vendors I'm aware of that are probably going to support it within the next year. But I can't speak to them. Um, one vendor. I'm going to leave it to Mark, but I think ratable sample values, the GEUR support, correct? Yes, yeah, certain versions support 
uh, radical sample values, and they're actually in service right now. They so, don't security go ahead. Yep. So right so uh, mid July there's going to be an interop of 61850 and our goose testing is being done there between Triangle, Toshiba, and maybe GE. I don't know if they're actually bringing it at this point in time. Um, so the, the last question here is the IP assignment is made uh, with IPv6 or via IPv4. Uh, the standard allows for both. Right now, Garibaldi only supports IPv4. As do the relays. As do the relays, yeah. Okay. Well, that comes to the end of our question and uh, answer session. I appreciate everyone staying on a little bit longer um, to stick with us, and thank you for your time. Um, as I mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago, when you do sign off, you will receive a survey. would really appreciate it if you filled that out and certainly want to get any feedback that you might have. Um, and please visit our website for a recording of this webinar in the, later this week. Okay, thanks everyone.